welcome NutritionRadio.org listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry, the university nutrition professor of over 20 years and podcast host of long-running shows like Iron Radio. Come on in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Nutrition Radio. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of things here before we even get into our uh, who we are. In the trends section, we're going to talk about gamification. I heard about this at conferences, academic settings. We're going to apply it to nutrition and fitness. In the science section, we'll do a light touch on espresso and brain health. In the third section, the weight management tip, we're going to talk about not bringing stuff home, right? What happens to that stuff when you bring it home? We're going to touch on that and dive into some discussion there. And then in the rant, we're going to talk about throwing away the scale, right? There's multiple aspects to this, and that's what we're going to hear from Lonnie about. Now, having said that, who am I? From the intro, I am Lonnie Lowry. I was a professor for about 20 years. Um, Currently an academic and food industry consultant. And sort of a serial podcaster. And today we have with us a healthcare professional, Lonnie Ducote. Hi there. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I'm Lonnie Ducote. uh, I've been in the fitness and nutrition world for about 20 years now. Um, also a former competitive bodybuilder. I did a show about 10 years ago and just generally speaking have been a weightlifting and nutrition kind of layperson enthusiast for the better part of two decades now. Right. Yeah. I've seen you online quite a bit. All right. So let's get to our first topic here, the food and fitness trend. Market news, food and fitness trends. Gamification. So, where did you come up with this idea? Uh, it's an idea I've seen just in various places. Um, I guess most simply you could describe it as attaching some kind of game-like element to a, a food and nutrition program. Um, so what that would mean is there's some kind of tracking involved with a progression. If you think of playing like a video game, you, you could level up or you have some goal to hit that advances you. Uh, I think most people would probably be aware of it if they have, like in its simplest form, if you have an Apple Watch, um, it has these little rings that you have to close every day. So, you know, you walk 10,000 steps and you close your ring or you you stand up 12 times and you close your ring, that kind of thing. Um, It taken to a little bit more of a, a broader goal or, you know, a, more complex program, they have apps that will, you know, you can hit your food intake goal for a week and then you gain little experience points or something depending on what app you're using. Uh, But the overall goal is to turn something drab and uninteresting like eating broccoli and you add some kind of fun element to it that, um, you know, the, the goal of it is to increase your your engagement in your diet and it, it adds something fun to it that you're, Hey, I, I, I wrote, I reached my goal for the week by eating, you know, a, three servings of vegetables every day. And then you get a little badge or something that some people can find motivating. This is a thing in academia. Uh, I, well, before we hit record everybody, uh, we were just talking about this. Like I know a professor who's trying to build this in. I, it might be the, some of the popularization of course, of video games and Dungeons and Dragons and all this kind of thing. But uh, I'm looking at a piece here from Edutopia using gamification to ignite student learning. And it's just reinforcing what you're saying, Lonnie. It's a, basically, it says in education, gamification is intended to transform traditional lessons into enhanced learning experience where students choose to explore certain content to earn badges and status benefits. And, you know, that makes sense to me. Like, oh, I got a badge for this or that. Or like you said, close the circle on something. I know there's a lot of apps, like phone apps, where uh, recently we had uh, Gabby Fairbanks talking about she likes to compete with family members from around the world. Like, oh, I got so many steps per day, and you didn't. And uh, I imagine there's sort of a social aspect of of this as well. Yeah, I have a a couple of coworkers have like a Peloton, and you know they the the thing they really seem to enjoy about it is like, oh, you know, I, I was number one for for six and a half minutes during that 15 minute run. So people do seem to respond to that kind of, you know, adding that extra element of, of you know, it being like a game. You know, you're not just riding your exercise bike. You're, 
you're the leader of the pack or you know something like that. So it does seem to add an extra element because it's the only thing that she talks about at work about it. She doesn't talk about you know the trainer or anything. It's kind of the the competitive game element to it that she that really seems to keep her going on it. Right. Yeah. Um, everybody, before we hit the record button, we were also talking about. I drove down to Houston for a space health conference and. Uh, they were talking about this. Elon Musk, I guess, is very big into this. SpaceX had a representative there, and they were talking about essentially gamifying physical activity because in space, you're right, your muscles and your bones waste away. They need countermeasures. And so they're like, how do we do this? And so they were talking about wearable sensors. You know, you can already do it with blood glucose. You can do it with, uh, you know, sleep and accelerometers and movement patterns. And so they're talking about continuously monitoring people. And then having them just play games. I mean, they were even talking about, now think about this in, in weightlessness and microgravity, real Quidditch. I mean, think about that for a minute, you know, <laughs> if you're familiar with uh, J.K. Rowling's work and stuff. But um, it's definitely getting attention both academically and um, with physical activity on some of these diet apps, uh, nutrition type things. I've been playing quite a bit with my fitness pal lately just to log stuff to see how much I actually eat compared to, you know, when I was uh, heavily training and, and competing in weightlifting sports and stuff. But uh, you said you were familiar with a couple of apps. Yeah, I think my fitness pal is probably one of the more prominent ones. Um, it allows you to kind of like put in a goal and that one actually has, you know, foods from like fast food restaurants and stuff you could enter in there that – make it very approachable in terms of like, oh, I had a, a six inch Subway sandwich, how much, you know, it'll have that in there for, for all of that stuff. So you don't have to, it takes out the guesswork for a lot of that. Um, most of the apps are actually geared toward like activity so that I don't know if there's a ton of nutrition specific ones out there, but my wife uses my fitness pal and seems to like how you can, you know, you set a goal for yourself, and then you have to, as she enters food, it kind of shows her, like, oh, she's approaching the top portion of her calorie allotment for today. And then it it lets her kind of visually see every day that she's achieving this goal that she set out for herself. So she's, she really does seem to get a little bit of extra uh, motivation and ability to stick with something beyond just, you know, oh, I'll just eat better this week. Right. That means. And, you know, you have no way of knowing if you did it and no feedback me mechanism to enforce like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing something and I've done something for six days in a row now. So, uh, you know, if I can do it for another weekday, that gives me a full week. So it, yeah. it kind of is another element to just bring it to the forefront of your mind instead of just that, the nebulous concept of eating better. Oh, I know. I, once I had a, a friend, he's like, I'm like, so what are your fitness goals? And he's like, oh, I just like to get my arms kind of bigger. I mean, no time, no time frame, no numbers. In fact, that was one of my decisions to actually compete in bodybuilding, like as a mid middle aged dude was, man, that sounded so disgustingly wimpy and vague. <laughs> I, I am going to make a commitment here, you know, but, but I, I've often said that you can't really, it's hard to pursue something you don't measure. You know, how do you know you're achieving the short term goals? What is the motivator? So, um, yeah, I'd, per, I'd encourage listeners to go check out, like, just Google gamification in fitness or gamification nutrition and see what you come up with because it's a, I don't know, maybe it's something that people, they already do with these apps and they're not even aware that they're engaging in it. Yeah, it's certain, as I've been aware of the idea, I've certainly seen it, like, not necessarily called, hey, we're gamifying our app, but that idea has spread kind of to be more... Uh, it's kind of in everything nowadays. Like I said, you know, it's 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 the number one thing I use my watch for. And they don't really call it, oh, we've gamified your your Apple Watch. It's right. just kind of a feature that's there. So it it's probably already in your life in some form or another. It's just some of these apps really take it to the next level. Um, I think there's even one called like Fitness RPG, where you you know you literally have like a character oh. that as it counts your steps, you level up and you know, it, it actually is like a game game that you play, and uh, I don't think that's funny. It's going to take the uh, the gaming world by storm, but it, it uh, no, may make right. your, your fitness <laughs> journey a little bit more fun. Yeah, yeah. No, cool. Okay, yeah. Well, I think that might be just an awareness piece. 
I know one of my goals just to have this podcast at all was to try to crowdsource ideas. That's a good one. That's not one I probably would have came up with myself, uh, but it is a real trend, and it's the kind of thing you might want to consider because I, I know they're using that in marketing and customer loyalty and whole lots of other things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, next up. Breaking Nutrition Science. We've got some of the breaking uh, nutrition science, and you had that piece on uh, espresso and uh, what type of cognitive decline was it or what kind of brain health was it? Yeah, so the the headline here is espresso can prevent Alzheimer's protein clumping in lab tests. And the, the summary on it is that in preliminary in vitro laboratory tests, so this is just test tube stuff here. Um, they're saying that espresso compounds can inhibit the tau protein aggregation, which is the process that is currently believed to be involved in the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So this is obviously very preliminary. It's not like in, in people measuring stuff, but at least in the test tube, they're seeing that caffeine uh, or in, in espresso can inhibit the uh, – you know, the process that, as we currently understand it, is involved in on high, Alzheimer's onset. Is caffeine good or bad? Here's a here's a, a point for the W column here. Right. Yeah. When I look at that stuff, because coffee is such a complex matrix of things, um, caffeine itself, I think, as you're pointing out, has some advantages. In fact, I once had a, a student that looked at that. That was like his senior undergraduate project was, does caffeine reduce some of these clumping proteins that interfere, you know, uh, or reduce their uh, spread, building and spread. But, you know, how much of this is the antioxidant effects of other things that might be in espresso, the chlorogenic acid, caffeic acid, there's diterpenes, there's all these different things. Um yeah, and it's, it's sometimes when you look at that, I don't know if that's the paper that I read recently, but it was suggesting that the espresso extracts were actually superior to some of the individual components. And that's an argument that I've been making for a while now. It sounds a little bit like the uh, cannabinoid argument about like an entourage effect, right, where you, you take one thing out of this complex natural matrix and then you don't get quite as good of an effect. Um, and again, I don't know if that's, if that's the same paper you're talking about, but um, – yeah, it's fascinating. It, the summary just lists espresso compounds, and then further down here, it starts going into the chemistry a little bit more, where it's caffeine, trigonaline, genistein, mm -hmm. and theobromine. So they're using all of those. So it, um, a little bit more to it than you know just caffeine. Yeah, As trigonaline or trigonellin. I'm still not clear on how to pronounce that. That's a niacin like compound that's in coffee. In the theobromine, I'm sure you know it's you know, that's also in like dark chocolate and stuff like that. Also a methyl xanthine. Um yeah, but that's fascinating stuff. Like you said, another another win in the column for um for coffee. And you know, we, we do have to be careful. I'd warn listeners uh, science doesn't care what we want, right? If something comes out and like, no, here's a really important reason why all this stuff is bunk. I would take a look at it, right? I, even though I've invested an awful lot of time and I even just published a big position paper on coffee and sports performance uh, with a bunch of uh, colleagues, uh, I still would take a back, uh, you know, a look at that and be like, well, I have to follow the data. And so I, I do think it's coffee, chocolate, that kind of stuff. We have to be careful hearing what we want to hear, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, but this is one that, yeah, like you said, it, it looks like a real uh, W. And I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, and like, contextually, it, you know, these are things that they're incubating in a lab in a test tube. So, good point. When you actually put it inside the human body, who knows if that's going to pan out? But right, it's something promising to look for as the research continues to mount up with all this, all this stuff. Yeah. I, I would certainly like to be able to drink coffee and prevent Alzheimer's. <laughs> oh, I know. I <laughs> that's know. That's all I had to do. <laughs> I hear you. My great grandmother had Alzheimer's. Now she was in her late eighties, I remember, but it was hard to watch. And so, yeah, anything, if, you know, if you're already doing it because you work out or you just love your coffee, you're a connoisseur, you're a coffee nerd, whatever, it's nice to know. Yeah, that might be happening. Some of the antioxidant effects or whatever it is. Cool. All right. So next, uh, in our weight management tip section, weight management tips. Uh, you had um, a comment about Berardi's law, John Berardi, as far as uh, – how is that stated? Uh, so, yeah, this, this was back when John Berardi was a little bit more prominent in writing back on 
Teen Nation, but it, it's a good idea, and it's always stuck with me. And uh, I'll say the law, and then Lonnie can add some commentary to it, because he, he was saying something kind of funny about it before we started taping. But basically, the idea is, you know, especially if you're, quote-unquote, on a diet, or, you know, trying to lose some weight, if something is in your house, you're probably going to eventually eat it. Yeah. I, I think this really begs the question... Uh, when do you make the decision to eat something? You know, it's for years and years we've talked about don't shop hungry. And that should make sense to people. You'll buy stuff that you normally wouldn't, right? Because your head isn't right. They'll mer- merchandise something on the end cap of the aisle in the grocery store. And, you, you know, you end up walking home with a box of ho-hos or something. You're like, I don't even <laughs> eat these things, you know, um, but you were starving and that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and that's right. We, I was joking earlier about how a lot of people in the fitness industry and they like to brand something that uh, clinicians and academics have done for a long time. So yeah, I'm not sure John came up with the whole, you know, food in the house means you will eat it, but it is a good point. If it's, if that makes it brief and so people can remember it, that's good too. But yeah, bring stuff home like I said, that's where you make that decision. Like I, I used to say in the classroom, if you've got a, a bowl of candy or munchy, savory junk food, and it, they're on the end stands around your couch, you're going to eat that stuff. Like you've already made the decision to eat it. Uh, you'd have to have the discipline of a green beret to look at that and be like, yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to have any of that. <laughs> well, you already brought it home. So yeah, it, it is a good point. And there's a lot, of, there's offshoots to some of these these old clinical adages as well, like make something very convenient. Um, we were just talking with Sean and Gabby Fairbanks about pre-prep and the importance of chopping stuff up, have it right there when you open your fridge. Um, because a lot of this is convenience. Everybody's pressed for time. And unless you can set aside a little bit of time, I don't know, on a Saturday or Sunday, whatever it is, to fry up some chicken or some vegetables or whatever and have it so it's just as easy to grab or nearly as easy to grab as those snacks on your end table, you're going to win. Your vegetable intake will go up. Lean protein sources will go up. Uh, You know, it's an important point. Do you follow this then? It sounds like you do. Uh, I certainly used to before I had, you know, the full family to take care of. It was much easier to, I actually, speaking of John Berardi, probably I almost hesitate to look at how long ago he published this. In my mind, it was three years ago, but it's probably been three right. years at this point. Yeah, yeah. But, so he, uh, back on T Nation, he wrote a diet called the Get Shredded Diet. And I successfully used that, you know, to go from pretty lean to very lean at one point in my life. So, you know, I was much younger. And so that kind of became like, oh, that's, I guess that's the way you do it. And so I, I glommed onto that for many years. But it was basically, you had, Three eggs with cheese and avocado for breakfast. And then for lunch, dinner, you had a third pound of beef with cheese and avocado. And so, uh, and then I had like cottage cheese and peanut butter before bed. So for, I mean, for years and years and years, all I used to buy was cottage cheese, peanut butter, ground beef, and avocado. Oh, wow. Like, Back when I was living alone, like you know, I, I, that was pretty much all that was in my fridge for who knows how long. With an occasional yeah. whatever, I on Fridays I would I would have a meal of whatever I wanted. So there was a, a little bit of variety in there, but right. Um, just well, by by virtue of following that diet, I kind of followed that law by default. Right. No, I hear you. Um, just the fact that you were a competitor, you know, people that try to compete and get that lean in bodybuilding or fitness sports and that kind of thing. If if listeners aren't familiar. Um, highly motivated, you will eat a very restricted diet for you know half a year at a time if you have to. That sounds like a very low carb approach. Uh, it was, yeah. Saying. It's like a, a, a cyclical ketogenic diet. So, oh, you know, got it. Six days out of the week, you're doing that, and then on pick a night of the week that you like, and you can eat kind of whatever you want. That's generally carb laden, carb heavy. Right. Yeah. To go to, Denny's and get their grand slam with a, a waffle and a big old bowl of oatmeal and brown sugar and toast oh. and hash browns. So. Replenish your glycogen stores, right? Your yeah. carb store. But back in the day when I thought anyone cared about what I looked like, it was like, I kind of imagined the Denny's staff going like, well, all, all we see this guy eat is this ridiculous meal and he just keeps getting leaner and leaner. Right. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure nobody ever made mention of it or even noted it, but 
in my head, that was kind of a funny little thing to imagine. I hear you. Uh, the first time I heard of cyclic ketogenic diets with the real low carb during the week and then maybe you know replenish on weekends kind of thing, that was Mauro, Dr. Mauro Di Pascali, yeah. I think. He did yeah, a lot the of anabolic that. diet. Yeah, yeah. Which I think he's flipped to the metabolic diet for what I imagine is marketing reasons. Oh, interesting. But... Yeah, I think overall it's just a way. I like the approach actually because then it helps prevent some of the, you would think at least, slowed metabolism from just being on a real low carb, real low calorie diet, you know, and, and then also preventing some muscle loss because you refill your muscles with carbohydrates, and, you know, on the weekend and when you get to refeed like that and, uh, keep you sane as well, I imagine, because otherwise, I, I've tried very, very low carb diets. I couldn't do it. In fact, when I used to diet to get very lean for contests, I, I would set a baseline carbohydrate level and then I would just progressively remove uh, as the weeks went by or the months went by because I, I feel like a progression model is important with that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, psychologically, that's a challenge in itself. Uh, like like your, to your point about the law of bringing it home, you're going to eat it. So I imagine, yeah, you just didn't bring home uh, a bunch of starches. Right, right. And now that I have kids and stuff, so it's like not only do I have to buy the Doritos, they go, Daddy, get me a bowl of Doritos. So now I have to oh. – I'm, I'm physically with my hands on the stuff, <laughs> like you know, delivering it to them. And I, I have to put the bag away and, and go, okay. <laughs> right. So you have to break the law and bring it home. <laughs> And serve it up. Yeah. yeah. But it does get eaten uh, to the point of the law. It's just hopefully by them before you, you know. Right. Um, that's another behavior and nutrition thing we used to talk about in the classroom, which was enablers. You know, I would talk about when my son was young and he's grown now, but uh, I would get like early on like a half a gallon of ice cream. Well, that's one of my weaknesses and I know it, you know, and I would – I'd wipe out the better part of a half a gallon of ice cream given the chance. So and then I started thinking, you know, I'm doing it for him. And I'm not going to not do it for him. I think, you know, kids need the calories and all that stuff to grow. So I started getting like individually wrapped like ice cream sandwiches or those little drumsticks or so, something that I was too guilty. There's only six of them in the box. And, yeah. I, you know, it wasn't family style where I would just dip into it and eat a bunch of it. But like, ah, it's all right. There's still some left for him. And that actually works. So I think people do need to think about these antecedents, these behavioral things that they're triggers, uh, you know, and avoiding the trigger by not bringing it home. Well, that's one way to deal with it, right? Because if you got convenient, like some fruits and vegetables and a bunch of lean meats in your fridge, and that's all you have when you're hungry, that's all you have. <laughs> yeah. If, if you can add some element of resistance to making a bad choice, that's probably going to, you know, if you have to get in the car and go drive you right. know, nine minutes to the store, or you, do you really need that Kit Kat bar that badly? Probably Right. Not. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good tip. It's a good behavioral tip. Um, even stuff like I've heard uh, dietitians talk about freezing certain foods so they're rock solid. And it's, yeah, like you said, it's just a barrier to indulge yeah, in a sense because so much of the food markets are about buy more, eat more. We were just talking about that last week because uh, that's how businesses work. And they're going right. to do everything they can to make you know the stuff that's convenient. And all you have to do is look around in society. Um, we used to teach in the classroom that a third of people were obese – and I think it's it's pushing fifty percent now. I mean, you know, we're heading in a really bad direction. And all the education that we've been offering for the last thirty years about here it comes, here it comes, we have to try to fight it. There's too much incentive. There's too many marketing dollars and, and everything else. To it's obviously not working. We are not creating this huge U-turn where all of a sudden Americans are, and probably Europeans, almost anybody is suddenly you know not getting fatter every year because we are. And so, yeah, easy to remember things like that are, are very handy. Yeah, food in the house means you will eat it. Yeah, I work at an office, or I, in an, you know, I work in an emergency room. But it, it between everyone that works there, it's kind of like an office environment. And so it's you know, it's there's probably on any given day fifty employees there, and it's just it always seems to be someone's birthday, someone's getting hired, someone's leaving. Uh, it's just like there's always some kind of, oh, you go in the break room and it's like, oh, well, there's, you know, there's a nice fresh pepperoni pizza that you have to. Oh, it, yeah, not kind of like Ferrari's law for the office there is like, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's a you know, fresh, fresh out of the fryer Krispy Kreme has just got delivered. because it's Oh, I know. 
it's Jennifer's birthday, so it's like, all right, well, if I can just resist for 30 minutes, maybe everyone else will eat them up before I... <laughs> right. Because you're not going to convince them to follow this law. Like, don't bring it to the office. Well, they're going, bullshit, I'm bringing the Krispy Kreme. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah, so, yeah, avoid it until they eat it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you can just have 30 minutes of discipline, it'll it'll work itself out for you. That's right. That's right. All right. And we have one last uh, bumper here, everybody. And we're going to go with a rant this time um, because uh, Lonnie mentioned earlier uh, something about throwing away the scale. Rant product review or recipes. Can you tell us about this? Like, why should people throw away the scale? Yeah, I just, especially in uh, American or Western culture, it just seems like you're, and this is probably a little bit more applicable to women, because just in my, in the last 20 years, I've kind of become like a a reference and a go-to for most of the people in my life for question and comments and discussions about weight loss and diets and women in particular society seems to try and just focus so heavily on their weight and you know there's these numbers that are kind of you you know i have to wear a size zero pant or those kinds of things loom so large to so many women in my life and the, the number one thing is like weight and of course that's what most of everyone is trying to do when they diet they want to lose fat or lose weight and so I just I've seen as people in my life diet or try and go on these things the the hyper fixation I would call it on the scale like you know the only thing that they really care about is seeing the number on the scale go down and there's even diets predicated entirely on doing that like there used to be this thing called the Hollywood 48 hour miracle diet where you would drink this you know, it was like a, it was a bottle. That was the name of the bottle. It was the Hollywood Forty Eight Hour Miracle Diet. It was probably just Gatorade of some kind, flavored water that you did something. But the entire point of it was, hey, over the weekend you'll quote unquote lose eight pounds, as if that was anything, you know, that was going to sustain or last more than past Monday. Right, the as you rehydrate, month. yeah, or whatever, yeah. And it, yeah, and then just you know that that's a little marketing gimmick. But beyond that, you know, I've seen people they'll stop a diet entirely because they they did everything they were supposed to do you know they they stopped eating those crispy creams at the office and they they ate their three servings of vegetables a day and they went from 161 pounds to 160 pounds and then the next week they were still 160 or especially women as their hormone cycles go up and down it's like they actually went from 160 to 163 so you know why am i dieting when i'm actually worse off than when i started Right, not recognizing it's hydration and not real fat loss or fat gain, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Back when I was competing, I used to, I was, I had it in context, but I, I did used to weigh myself. Um, I had like a a uh, like a gold standard where it was like Sunday after I woke up, after I would go to the bathroom. So I, I tried to eliminate as many variables as I could to try and get like a a true weight. But in during the week, I would also weigh myself. And yeah, I mean, you can shift around three or four or five pounds depending on the carbohydrate composition and the water composition of your diet. So I, to an extent, the scale is useful, but I've seen people just put so much emphasis on it that they'll just yeah. you know they'll just call the whole thing off if they feel like they've put in this monumental effort of willpower and discipline, and they've gone to the store and they they're only buying fresh foods and they're cooking up stuff and then you know three weeks have gone by and this the the only number that they're caring about hasn't budged or you know like i said in some cases can even go the opposite direction that they want to do that they just go i ah, forget it yeah and they'll, there's they'll so call many the things. whole thing off <laughs> there's a lot to unpack i mean all this talk about glp1 meds and massive 15 17 percent weight loss one of the critiques of that has been yeah but how much of that is fat versus muscle I mean, yes, there's some fat loss involved, but it's even the academic papers, body weight, body weight, body weight. You know, I have been relegated to lifting at Planet Fitness for the past uh, several (laughs) months. I'm not much of an endorsement for them, I know. Uh, But one of the things I asked is one of them was 
it's somehow more independently owned and they had a scale. So I'm like, oh, I'll weigh myself. I, it's something I keep an eye on, but you know, obviously with body composition and everything else, I, I mean, I could be gaining muscle over a couple of months and losing some fat. The scale's not going to change if it's happening, you know, um, in a contradictory sort of way. But then I asked uh, at another one, uh, and because it's a chain, that's what I need because I'm traveling and whatnot. And uh, I'm like, you guys don't have a scale. The other one didn't have a scale. How come the one had a scale? And they're like, oh, that one's more independently owned or whatever. I'm not sure all the details. But she's like, yeah, we don't do that. And so to your point, they did throw away the scale. Uh, and I'm like, you know, I get it. Pros and cons. I get it because people do, you know, obsess with that kind of stuff. I heard back in the day, I mean, God, this is probably 15 years ago. I think it was Weight Watchers. Um, and maybe a listener can write in and correct me if it wasn't. But they would have people do weekly weigh-ins. And if you reached a certain scale weight, everybody would applaud. And if you didn't, they would withhold the applause and there'd be dead silence. Mm. That's that's not – I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should only really be weighing yourself if you do once a week probably. To, and you're looking for – even then you're looking for trends over time you know, because uh, we've done a couple episodes, I think you know uh, – of nutrition radio where we talked about like the grim facts of fat loss. I mean, if there's 3,500 calories stored in a pound of fat, uh, and even if you burn a hundred percent fat in your workouts, which you don't, um, uh, it, it, the protracted time frames are not very motivating. So doing this sort of, uh, celebration of the scale. And like I said, even with all the stuff on with the GLP one meds and all the weight loss, even in non-diabetics and all these Hollywood people on it and everything else and politicians, it's body weight, body weight, body weight, and I don't know. Maybe because I was interested in bodybuilding early on, I understood that you could gain muscle or you could lose fat, and there's a hydration issue that you talked about. There's just a ton going on there, and it's just not like we should weigh less. Now, don't get me wrong. Weighing less overall it is something you should consider. Like I know blood pressure and some other things are hugely impacted by that. Like with me, if I get down around 200 pounds or less, my blood pressure is just lower. And if right. not, my family history kicks in and I start looking mildly hypertensive. And so body weight does matter, and I'm sure you agree, but not to the extent the way people obsess. Yeah, I kind of circumvented that a little bit it just with my wife. By I would have her take uh, – I have like a tape measure. So you just you know, measure a thigh, measure your hips, measure your oh. glutes, measure mm -hmm. you know measure three or four areas and the weight. You know, and we I think you probably know that body fat doesn't come off evenly as you are losing weight. So you know, just try and find some amount of progress somewhere aside from just the scale weight going down. So you might lose a quarter inch off your thigh one week, and then your love handles go down a quarter inch the next week, but your thigh stays the same, and the scale weight drops a half a pound. So I, I always try and build in like several ways to progress into any smart, anything. So you're not just if, – if one thing doesn't go the way you think it's going to go, your whole thing just doesn't crumble. Right. It's, it's such a psychological endeavor that – I mean it really can be devastating if you put in three weeks worth of work and you, know, you kind of upended the way your life used to be in terms of the things you were eating. And wow, I'm, I actually weigh more than I did. I mean, it, that can be very – take a huge psychological hit. Yeah. Yeah. Planet Fitness, don't they have – do they still have like pizza parties on Tuesdays and stuff? You know, I'm not sure. Do, one of their selling points. Oh, yeah. I think they used to serve some type of donuts or something too. Yeah, it was and like they always had Tootsie Rolls on the counter and they used to have pizza or something. They still have Tootsie Rolls. I think they probably got cheap and they just do the Tootsie Rolls now. And I get it. They're trying to make a non-judgment environment and all that kind of thing. But yeah, to directly sabotage people, I'm not sure that's the yeah, just, best idea. The place that's serving you pizza probably doesn't want you to step on the scale afterwards, I would imagine. No, right. Hence no scale, right? Um, yeah, but – and I think the, the decisions to keep the Tootsie Rolls is because they're just dirt cheap. <laughs> right, <laughs> now, right. they might make the argument, oh, if you just have one or two, that's very few calories. Okay, but I also know that's a that's probably monetarily driven, you know. But, that's... yeah, the, the scale is I, – I don't think it's going to go away. Uh, 
But, it's useful. I don't, you know, I, I throw away the scale is kind of a marketing language thing, but it's like, you know, just don't make the scale the the sole yeah the sole measurement of what success looks like for a, a diet program. Right. I love what you're saying about choose multiple things. When I used to design research, my dissertation was like this. I measured like 18 different things, and and. Even when I do studies with students now, sometimes I'll I'll say, let's pick one or two objective measurements and then one or two subjective measurements, especially with coffee, because, you know, you can always do like the mood and the alertness and all that kind of stuff. But let's get something that's very dry and neutral and objective. Then let's get, in, get something subjective. But you've got to measure multiple things like you're saying. I love that. There's got to be a, a catchy marketing phrase to get that out there. I love it. You, because each one of these things has limitations and flaws and error. So if you're using something like that's a, a great tip. If you're going to weigh weigh yourself, also measure the girth of something, you know, but know that over time it's going to be slow. Dietary changes and exercise changes are very slow and they, they demand delayed gratification and a certain level of maturity. But if you're measuring multiple things, I love it. You know, and I think measuring strength should be part of that, by the way. People are into fitness. I know nutrition radio is about the nutrition, but when it comes to muscle loss with age like sarcopenia, they're really looking at strength much more than just the muscle size and muscle mass. Um, And strength is something that, you know, if your strength is going up month to month, which it should, that should move much more quickly than body fat coming down. So I was always a huge fan of trying to introduce something to people if if they come to the gym trying to change their body composition, trying to lose quote unquote weight. It's like, okay, let's throw in some of the strength training. It's going to help you reduce body fat over time. It's going to change. And there's your, there's your reward badge. Talk about gamification, right? Like, oh, look, I'm making gains. I'm leveling up in strength. And even though my body weight isn't changing much and hopefully over time, the body fat will come down. I mean, in, in all logic, it probably would because they're getting reward um, that little level up on the strength side to help with their, uh, their psychology of all of it, you know. I guess probably to combine maybe several of our stories together, that's another thing my wife had in that app, or just, you know, the idea that, like, I'm not entirely, you know, who knows objectively what she's supposed to be eating on any given day, but, you know, they you have to estimate it at some point and come up with a number to eat. But it's not like they have her on a thousand calorie deficit. It's, you know. Right. 300 maybe and so you know you you have to string together 30 days worth of of doing that correctly to even be in the you know two pound weight loss area right over to even month. see I mean, it you know, and just through my experience i've noticed it, it really takes about depending on how big you are but you know it really does take about 20 pounds before people go hey have you lost weight oh it's yeah like a, now you have to do three weeks now you have to do that 10 times 20 times before you know it's even visually notable in the mirror absolutely and you know if you're just sitting there waiting for the scale to move it's just another thing to kind of be like oh what's taking so long yeah you know we're talking about uh t mag and and t nation and all that and fitness and nutrition websites and stuff back in the day i wrote an article called 100 workouts and that it was it was in a, city. My my intent for that before the editors got a hold of it was <laughs> was partly Sucked that me in. it took a hundred sessions to lose ten pounds of fat, like a three hundred and fifty calorie treadmill workout. If you pretend it's one hundred percent fat loss, which it's not, right? But if you do, that's a hundred sessions to lose ten pounds. And to your point, Lonnie, other people aren't even going to notice the ten pound loss on you. So it would probably take two hundred sessions if you held your diet perfectly you know, steady to lose enough weight for people to even notice. That's a long time. You're literally talking about, you know, nearly half a year, let's say, especially if you don't want to lose a lot of muscle by, you know, over dieting real quickly. And that's been one of the critique of these GLP one agonists, right? The weight loss is very rapid and you, you could lose muscle tissue because you don't have appetite and you're nauseous and, you know, you're not eating enough protein, whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, I mean, it takes a long time, just the energetics, the math of it all is brutal and you you can't expect, and I know in today's society, that's hard. Maybe that's where the gamification to bring it back to that again, it does offer some immediate feedback, a little win 
to keep you on track with the short term goals because otherwise, yeah, I feel like we should be focusing on strength or other things instead of just the scale. The scale should move. Ultimately, it is kind of a bottom line, but it moves too slowly, you know, for anybody to get a lot of <laughs> reward, I think. Yeah, and I, the kind of person that is going to do what needs to be done to make it move quickly probably doesn't really need that tip. But if it takes all of your willpower just to, to go through the week in a 300-calorie deficit, yeah. back when I was dieting, I used to run you know, really significant deficits. Um, I, there were yeah. Some days I used to just fast entirely. So. Oh, I know. I mean – I would think that if you want to see measurable progress, because we have to think about the sensitivity of the measurement, right? A scale is plus or minus a certain amount, like you said, from daily fluctuation. So you can't get caught up in that. Um, I don't know. It's it's back to the importance of measuring multiple things while you do it. And a lot of studies will do a 500 calorie deficit. Um, I would probably do 500 to a thousand. Uh, I was trying, and I was trying to make slow movements too. But I would try to get that deficit partly through cardio and you know other things as well, um, because you know that's the other thing a lot of people need to think about: how much of this is restriction at the mouth versus expenditure <laughs> through activity and all that kind of stuff. It's there's a lot of nuances to it, but um, cardio yeah. is depressingly slow too. I mean, when you when you compare like how many calories are in a slice of pizza versus. Now you oh, have man. to walk for an hour on the treadmill to burn that. Absolutely. We talked about that in season one a little bit. It was just, yeah, it, it's not cool the way that journalists say, oh, you know, how long do you have to run to get rid of that donut? I, <laughs> they make it look like exercise is anti-eating. I hate that. Exercise is to get all these different adaptations, more mitochondria and more capillaries and more muscle mass and better heart function. All these things build a new you. So your machine is different, and then you will get leaner over time. But they make yeah. it look like it's just anti-eating. And to your point, Lonnie, oh, my God, it's grim, right? It's, the, the numbers are grim. You'd have to run for a really long time to get rid of that donut. You, now, the fly in the ointment, of course, is you have a background resting metabolic rate that's always running, and it's not just when you're exercising. And I think that's really important. People, the biggest – calorie dump every day is just your resting metabolic rate yeah, just and that's probably alive. just being alive just breathing yeah um and you know because that might be 12 1500 calories a day depending on your body size or even more and you know a workout of that magnitude would be brutal so <laughs> but so yeah it's another reason why they have to be very careful uh with those ins and outs and all that kind of stuff i mean physiology and nutrition it's complicated stuff and there's a lot of nuances. We were just talking about Iron Radio this morning about you know the half truths that often get told, and it's it's almost lying by omission because the devil's in the details. So yeah, but I, I do like the idea. Of throw away the scale when I when I hear about and maybe it's urban legends about people applauding when people lose X number of pounds to some target. I'm, I want to lose two pounds this week. I've always recommended to clients in the past half a pound a week. Some you know realistic because to your point, otherwise the calorie deficits every day have to be huge. And if you're highly motivated, like you were as a competitive bodybuilder, you might be willing to do that. But a lot of people, that'd be so hard. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, to an extent, I was kind of getting a kick out of it back then. So to me, that was, you know, not only was it easy, but it was like, you know, almost kind of joyful and some kind of, you know, yeah, self abuse, like self discipline, kind of. Yeah, I know. I hear you. Like you, there's a certain element of pride. Like I can do something most people can't do, and this is this is grim stuff. <laughs> but yeah, you guys have said it a thousand times on this show and Iron Radio, where it's like the competitive aspect of all of that doesn't necessarily relate to health in any way. So no, that's uh, right. Running yeah. a 1,500 calorie a day deficit. Oh gosh, uh, you know I'm not brutal. I don't know entirely how healthy it is for any kind of long term thing. Right. And it's also important for people to know when, when Lonnie says something like a 1500 calorie deficit, you might be starting at 3000 or even more like an average person who eats 2000 calories a day. I would not say go on a 1500 right. calorie. De Oftentimes a, a gross rule of thumb in dietetics has been, uh, you can't really get enough variety to get all of your nutrients if you go below 1200 calories. And so, um, especially on the get shredded diet where you're eating four things. 
Right. No variety. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Well, there's our four topics for this week, everybody. We had that the gamification trend. Please go check that out. There's a lot to learn there. That is a great tip. And it really can inject some fun into into the mix, especially really like can. I think uh, Gabby was, you know, she gets her whole family involved in it. And so it, 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 there's more to it than just, hey, I'm playing a game. So, Right. No, absolutely. Especially because of what we just said about some of the grim realities of uh, the math that goes behind losing lots and lots of body fat. It's a very – it takes a lot, a lot of calories before you start to notice – and even more before other people do. So maybe the gamification is is a way to do that. Like I said, that's even used in industry with consumer loyalty and stuff. Mm-hmm. I appreciate the espresso article in our science bit. Uh, I did see a little bit of that recently. Very cool stuff uh, with that. Uh, number three, the weight management tip. As far as food in the house, you're going to eat it. Yeah, a lot of people, I just don't think, consider it that way. They don't frame it that way, you know. Like the decision is not just made when you're in the house. Sometimes it is when you have little enablers, (laughs) but, but yeah, better when you have the control not to bring it home or bring home something that maybe the kids like, and you don't, Uh, I don't know, something like that. Um, And then yet the scale topic is true on both a psychological level and a body comp level. There's real limitations to that. So try to measure as Lonnie suggested other things, whether it's tape measure or, you know, I was suggesting even strength if you want to start a fitness program. Look at other things. Measure more than one thing like the scale. Yeah, I like the strength there too because then that's it, that's something going up. So it, that's kind of an interesting juxtaposition to the scale going down. You have this other thing that's, you know, you're trying to improve it in some way. Yeah, and I mean – Looking at some of the old exercise physiology stuff, you can change your strength like 15, 20 percent or more in a relatively short period of time. It's going to be noticeable, whereas the body fat's probably not. All right. We're there. That's Nutrition Radio for the beginning of September. It looks like we, we might actually have five weeks, uh, you're telling me, this month. So we'll see where that goes uh, as far as if you're willing to <laughs> do all five <laughs> But there's all kinds of yeah. fun stuff. We're going to talk probably next time, everybody, about some uh, different omega-3 fats. I was just talking about half-truths given by the media and even some educational sources. We'll talk about omega-3 fats. There's more than one kind um, and uh, lots of stuff coming down the pipe. So uh, thanks for coming on, my man. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and if your millions of adoring fans will have me, I'm, I'll be here all five weeks. Awesome. Yeah, all five. <laughs> <laughs> all right. See you next time. All right. Bye-bye. The NutritionRadio.org podcast is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, check with your physician, nutritionist, or qualified exercise physiologist in order to make the progress that you need.